We've all grown up saying it over and over and over and over and over again. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. The question that we want to raise today or speak to today is not the question of do religion and politics mix? That's not the question. The question is how do they mix? Now you know something is wrong when the church of Jesus Christ is divided along political lines. If the church of Jesus Christ allows politics to bring about a division, and it has. And that's why 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is probably still the most segregated hour in America. Because political expediency often overrides the kingdom of God. Ezekiel is addressing a problem, and that is the departure of the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord has taken flight. God's presence was no longer being experienced in the society. God had distanced himself from his people. In chapter 43, the glory of the Lord is about to return. And Ezekiel, in his vision, is reciting the return of the glory of the Lord. But in reciting the return of the glory of the Lord, he also recites why the glory of the Lord left. And in reciting the glory of the Lord leaving the temple, which meant leaving the culture, he makes a very interesting statement in verses 7 through 9. He said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell among the sons of Israel forever. And the house of Israel will not again defile my holy name, neither they nor their kings. By their holotry and by their corpses of their kings when they die. How did they do this? Verse 8. By setting their threshold by my threshold. And their doorpost beside my doorpost, with only the wall between me and them. And they have defiled my holy name by the abominations which they have committed, so I have consumed them in my anger. God says that the human kings which was the government in biblical days, the human kings were allowed to put their throne next to his throne. In other words, government was allowed to intrude on the rule of God. Government was allowed to get so close to God that there were two thrones in God's house. There was the throne of the government and there was the throne of God in God's house. So you got two kings in my house. You got human kings, human government, and you got me and you treating us like we equals. You have allowed politics, if you will, government to intrude and when government came in, the kings, it says they brought their abominations with them. So when the government came in, it came in and it brought its view of things, which was not my view of things. He calls it holotry here, which was a form of idolatry, a mixing of a relationship that was illegitimate, an illegitimate relationship between church and state. Between government and God. The temple was God's throne. Well, what do you do on a throne? You rule. A throne is where somebody rules. He says, in this house, it's my throne. I run the show in this house. Don't be bringing kings up in this house who will challenge 
contradict or invalidate my throne. Don't let them bring their throne to mess with my throne. At the heart of the doctrine of the separation of the church and state is to never be a separation between God and government. As long as you know that God says in this house, my throne rules. The temple was God's residence, but the kings had defiled God's name by bringing civil religion into the church. Now, I am a consummate American. The Bible says, honor the king and honor the country. And so it is very valid to honor where you live and where God has placed you. But there are limitations. When these two thrones are made equal. He calls it an abomination to bring in your politics and allow them to contradict the throne of God. Now, please don't misunderstand me, as I'm going to show you in a moment. God is not against government. In fact, you're going to see in a second, God established government, but he didn't establish it to compete with him. He established it to serve him. And he certainly didn't establish it to compete with him in his house. Which in this case was the temple. So first of all, we have to make clear, what is this relationship between God and government? Well, I, there are a lot of places we could go. But let me just start with probably the premier scripture on the subject. And that is Romans chapter 13. Every person is to be, verse 1 says, into subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed it will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. For government, it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid for it does not bear the sword for nothing. The goal of government is to act on God's behalf in promoting good and limiting evil. The fundamental job of government is to promote good in society and keep bad from proliferating in society. And that can happen on business levels and civic levels and, and all those kinds of things. The world, brothers and sisters, is a theocracy. Theo, God. Ocracy, rule. The world is ruled by God. God has set up systems in the world by which he rules. And these systems are called government systems. There are three government systems in the Bible. The family is a governmental system. Why? Because it has a jurisdiction and it has consequences tied to behavior. The church is a governmental system. It has been given a certain jurisdiction with responsibilities tied to behavior. Then there is civil government, which is a jurisdiction, and it has to do with the order of society. And God says, I run them all. I sit on the throne and I give the guidelines by which all three of those institutions work. The family, the church, and the civil government. Now what he is saying is, I don't want them telling me what to do. That's the bottom line. I can tell them, they can't tell me, we are not equals. Don't allow the institutions, and I can apply it to any of them, although I'm talking about civil government, he would say to a man in the house, he would say, you the head of the house, kinda. You're the head of the house underneath me, 1 Corinthians eleven three 3 says. Tony Evans, you're the shepherd of this house, kind of. You are underneath me. The moment that any institutional leader extracts himself from God, he is no longer governing God's way. But when you allow that to enter into God's house, you have messed with his throne. And what God did, watch, watch what God did, his glory departed. 
that is, if you want government to rule independently of me, or you're going to compromise my throne with that throne, I'm going to find some place else to hang out. It is the job of government to reflect a theocracy that already exists. It is the job of the family to reflect a rule that already exists, and that is God's rule. Families are fine, but they're to complement God's rule. Churches are fine, they're to complement God's rule. So if a government is fine, it's to complement God's rule. So the glory of the Lord left because the kings were allowed to have a position that was unauthorized by God in God's house. So where have we positioned politics in our worldview? Dr. Evans will have some thoughts about that when he continues our message in just a moment. Stay with us. Too often, it's an us-versus-them society, even among believers. It shouldn't be like this, and it can't be like this. Unity is key to spiritual victory, and when believers stand shoulder-to-shoulder in prayer, darkness is overcome. In his book, Stronger Together, Weaker Apart, Powerful Prayers to Unite Us in Love, Dr. Tony Evans urges you to unite in prayer, providing a starting place and then inviting you to pray in your own words. Find out more about Stronger Together, Weaker Apart. Visit TonyEvans.org. Stronger Together, Weaker Apart is the perfect prescription for the separation and discord tearing apart our nation, our churches, and even our families. It's more than just managing to grit your teeth and get along. This collection of soul-searching prayers and devotions will teach you how to actually love people you disagree with as you work towards spiritual unity. We'll send you a copy of Stronger Together as our way of saying thanks for your contribution to help continue Tony's ministry on the air and around the world. Along with it, we'll also include all 14 full-length messages in his current two-volume teaching series, Turning a Nation to God, first as instant digital downloads, then on CDs that will come to you along with the book. But this is a limited-time offer, so don't delay. Contact us right away at TonyEvans.org. Or give our Resource Center a call at 1-800-800-3222, where one of our team members will be happy to help you. Again, that's 1-800-800-3222. I'll have that information once again after part two of today's message. Here's Dr. Evans. Now, I would like to suggest that one of the problems we face today is that we have allowed politics to dictate to the kingdom of God. I love the story in um, Joshua 5. You don't have to turn there. But Joshua is getting ready to go into battle. He's getting ready to go to war. And uh, he's getting ready to go up against his enemy. And this other army comes alongside with this huge guy who's a captain. And he's leading this huge army. Now Joshua, Joshua's mama ain't raised no dummy. Joshua has a real question here. Joshua said, I'm getting ready to go fight these folks, but here this army that I don't know anything about has come out of nowhere. Now, I'm going to fight them, and then this other group is over here, and I don't know who they are. So let me find out who these folk are. Because he says, if they are fighting with them, then I got to rethink my position. All right? But if they are fighting with us, well, now I'm good to go. So he goes and he asks the captain of the army, whose side are you on? He want to know whether I'm fighting one army or two. So he goes and he says, sir, whose side are you on? The captain, the head of the army, looked at Joshua and made a powerful statement. He says, I am neither on your side, nor am I on their side. And then he says, I am captain of the Lord's army. Translation, I did not come to take sides, I come to take over. Until you and I understand, God does not ride the backs of donkeys or elephants. He has his own throne. He makes his own rules and sometimes that's going to come out on the side of Republicans and sometimes that's going to come out on the side of Democrats. But if you are so committed to a king or to a political persuasion, just because you're more socially sensitive and you're concerned about justice doesn't give you the biblical right 
to overrule the throne of God on that issue. But because we have become so committed to the kings, that is to a political persuasion, regardless of the fact that it competes with the throne of God, that we have turned many of our pulpits into governmental or political playgrounds instead of representing the throne room of God irrespective of a particular political persuasion. Look, I don't care what you are. You can come in here as a Democrat. You can come in here as a Republican. Just know when you come in here, there is another throne. As long as you understand that. He says, you let the kings put their stuff next to me. And that was an abomination. There is only one throne. And one throne room. And God does not want the political realm. He wants us involved in politics. Absolutely. God has set up politics. Any Christian who refuses to vote, any Christian who refuses to take their civic responsibility seriously is nullified like a father who's failing the father or a mother who's failing the mother or a pastor who's failing the shepherd. A citizen who refuses to meet their civic governmental responsibility is failing the kingdom of God. But in fulfilling that responsibility, you've got to remember as a believer, there's only one throne. Watch this. Then, when they had finished the house, putting the house together, he led me to the gate, the gate facing the east. God wasn't going to come back to a house that was still compromising with kings. He says, when the house was ready, I saw the glory of the Lord. When the house was built according to the specifications of God's guidelines. Now, Verse 10 of chapter 43. As for you, son of man, describe the temple to the house of Israel. Describe, you say, the church to the nation. That they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure the plan. Let them look at the plan I put down for the house. If they are ashamed of all they have done, which one of the main things was an illegitimate use of politics, make known to them the design of the house, its structure, its exits, go and tell them the details of this house and write it in their sight. I'm going to close with this one. Watch this now. Write down the details of my house so that they may observe the whole design and its statues and do them. This is the law of the house. The entire area on top of the mountain, all around it shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the house. All of us have a house. That's, we'll call it our throne room, the place where we live with family. I am sure you, like me, have rules that govern your house. First of all, those are rules for your family members. That is, those who live in your house operate by those rules. But you also have rules for visitors who come to your house. When children bring their friends to your house, I think most of you would say, if your teenage son brought in his teenage boys and they were cussing up a storm in your house, the fact that they were not your kids becomes irrelevant. Because they in your house. See, once they come into your house, now all of a sudden, your rules, but you can't change how they talk outside of your house but once they cross the wall into your house they now have to function by your rule if your kid come in smoking weed I think at least I hope somebody gonna say something you can't smoke reefer and weed in my house why because it's my house all right, I've got certain rules. If you got to drink Jack Daniels, you can't drink Jack Daniels 
in my house. But I don't care that you've always drunk Jack Daniels. I don't care that Jack is your best friend. All of that becomes uh, insignificant because once you cross the wall, you are in my house. That means that you must adjust. Well, guess what the church of Jesus Christ has been doing? We've not been going by the law of the house. We've been going by the law of the secular world and letting it into the house. We've been letting the drug addicts run the house. We've been letting the prostitutes run the house. We've been letting the profane run the house. And we wonder why the glory of the Lord ain't hanging out in the house. In Deuteronomy 17, God says, the king is to read my word every day. Along with the priest, that's government and religion, because my throne rules all of it. Now, you can't make government read it. You can't make government read it. But you can't let the government that doesn't read it bring their non-reading perspective in my house. Dr. Evans will come back in a moment with a final challenge to wrap up today's program. But first, if you'd like to get the full-length version of today's lesson, which includes material we couldn't fit into our program time, contact us for details on the title, The Separation of Church and State. You can also get it as a part of Tony's two-volume compilation, Turning a Nation to God. It contains 14 of his most hard-hitting lessons on what it means to be a citizen of heaven living on earth. Just visit us at TonyEvans.org for the details. And as I mentioned earlier, you can also get a copy of Tony's powerful book, Stronger Together, Weaker Apart, as our gift to you when you make a contribution to help keep this program on this station each day. This is a limited-time offer, so don't wait. Get details and make your request today at TonyEvans.org. Or give us a call at 1-800-800-3222, where we have team members standing by day and night to help you with resource requests. Again, that's 1-800-800-3222. Crying out to God for revival can seem very spiritual. But tomorrow, Dr. Evans will explain why there's something we should want even more desperately. Be sure to find out what it is. But right now, he's back with this final comment. So my challenge to you, very personally and very practically, is to maximize your political power and potential. And know that in every political party, there are great righteous goals and there are great unrighteous ones. And you just be faithful to the law of the house. And here's why. When the glory of the Lord returned to the temple, the nation was blessed. The problem of our nation is that the glory has left the house. That's where the problem is. Because the glory has left the house, there is nothing to overflow to the community, nothing to overflow to the nation. You bring back the glory to the house, and it becomes a blessing to the nation. May God help us to keep politics in its rightful place. And that is not compromising the law of the house. The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans is brought to you by The Urban Alternative and is made possible by the generous contributions of listeners like you. Now, Father, as we humbly come before you through the word, not only give us ears to hear, but wills to respond so that this is not a wasted gathering. We've been encouraged, we've been inspired, but we know what we really need is to be transformed. Start with me, but encapsulate us all. And we will give and pay homage to the Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
When you audit a course in college, what you are saying is, I want the information without the responsibility. I want to learn whatever the course is seeking to teach, but don't give me homework and don't give me exams. I don't want the work of it, I just want the knowledge about it. You may be able to do that with college, but you cannot do that with the Christian life. You cannot audit it. What many people do is they come to church to hear the word, to be inspired by the word, but who don't plan to do any of the work. They don't want to incur any of the responsibility of it, but they like the learning about it. Well, in college, you need to know that when you audit a course, you don't get credit for it because you didn't put in what the course required. And when you audit the Christian life by coming to hear the word, to be inspired and encouraged by the word, but to not act on the word that you've heard, you may have more knowledge and you may be more inspired, but you won't be changed. Because the transformation in the life through the word has to be activated by obedience. Without that, it becomes information with no credit. That is no transforming value. We're now at the sixth church that the Apostle John has written, the church at Philadelphia. This is the first Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. This Philadelphia, in verse 7 of Revelation 3, is located some 30 miles southeast of Sardis, a great commercial city with a major trade route plagued often with earthquakes. That was the nature of this city. Inside this city, was a small church, a small gathering of believers, Philadelphia Bible Fellowship. This small gathering of believers found themselves in this pagan realm and Jesus, who is the spokesperson through the shepherd of each one of these churches, speaks through this leader to the saints at Philadelphia Bible Fellowship at the church in Philadelphia and notice what he says verse 7 he who is holy who is true who has the key of David who opens and no one will shut and who shuts and no one opens says this so before we get into all the idiosyncrasies of what he has to say to this church he wants to give another description of himself which he has done in each of these churches and he describes himself as he who is holy and true. Holy means to be set apart as unique, special, or one of a kind. Holy means you're not be, to be put in a class with anything else. I describe holy often in using the difference between dishes in the sink, dishes in the kitchen, and dishes in the dining room. The dishes in the sink are dirty. They are dirty dishes. That's why they're in the sink. The dishes in the kitchen are common dishes. You use that for all of your meals. But the dishes in the den, well, they got their own room. They got their own glass case because they are special. They're not integrated with the common, and they're certainly not integrated with the profane, the dirty. No, they're in a, that, that's special. They come out on special occasions. Jesus says, don't put me in a room with anybody else. Don't, don't make me another one of the people you recognize. I'm not just a good person. I'm not just a great prophet. I am holy. I am separate. I am one of a kind. I am unique. I'm in a class by myself. In Isaiah 40, verse 25, the Bible says God is holy. So when Jesus declares himself to be holy, he declares himself to be God. So we're not just talking about another name or one of the crowd. He says, uh, I am unique, and therefore must be viewed and treated uniquely. I am not only holy, I am also true. Truth has to do with ultimate reality. I'm the real deal. 
Anything that contradicts me is false and is a lie and cannot be trusted. So you are to measure everything by the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So everything is to be measured by its inconsistency and compatibility to me. And if it's incompatible and inconsistent with me, it's wrong no matter who told it to you, how long you believed it, and how well you know it. I am truth. I am holy and true. Not only am I unique and set apart, not only am I ultimate reality, but now he gets to the nitty gritty. He says, I have the key of David. I have the key of David. Now to appreciate what he's talking about, this is drawn from Isaiah chapter 22, verses 15 to 25. In Isaiah chapter 22, verses 15 to 25, the steward of the house of David, the kingdom, house of David, David was, was the king of Israel, it uses that to speak of the kingdom, the key belonged to this steward, but the steward did not do the right job. So he was uh, fired. And when he was fired, a new steward replaced him. This new steward was Eliakim, and Eliakim was given the key to the kingdom. Not given a key, he was given the key. Jesus says, I possess the key of the king of David, of the kingdom of David. That is, I have the kingdom key. Notice it's a single key because it's a master key. Anybody who possesses a master key can get any, in any door. All the doors are available to him because he has a master key. So when the Bible speaks of the key, it speaks of two things, access and authority. So Jesus claims access to any door and authority over every door. Let me say that again. Jesus, the one with the key, the master key, has access to every door, which is what a master key gives you, and authority over every door, which is why he says he can open the doors he wants to open and lock the doors he wants to stay locked because he is in charge. Now, if you and I don't get that, we're going to think people are in charge. We're going to think power brokers are in charge. We're going to think folk with money are in charge. We're going to think folk with clout are in charge. They may have a key, they don't have a master key. They may have a key to a door, they don't have a key to every door. Jesus says, I control the kingdom because I have control of the master key. Or as he says in Matthew 28, verse 19, he says, all authority has been given to me, not only in the sweet by and by, but in the nasty here and now. He says, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Oh, to put it in everyday language, I got the key, so I'm in charge. I run the show. Now, in Matthew chapter 16, he says, I'm going to build my church, and I will give my church the keys to the kingdom. Watch this now. Jesus says, I have the master key. That's one key that can lock any door. But I'm going to give to my people, the church, I'm going to give them the keys, plural, to the kingdom. So what he's given us is multiple keys to multiple doors while he possesses the master key to every door. So he has the key, we have the keys. How does it work? When you use the right key, he'll back it up with the master key. But when you use the wrong key, the master key can't back you up because the master key can only be consistent with the keys that he's given us. Let me put it another way. If you skip God's way to get it done, whatever it is you're trying to get done, then don't just call on God to use his master key when you've ignored the key he gave you. He does not want you to skip the responsibility he's given you and simply call on him because he got the master key. He wants to know your keys are consistent with his key. I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Well, what is that? It's authority. I'm going to share my authority with you when you are consistent with me. Authority, kingdom, means to rule. 
so God wants to rule not only in heaven but in history through the person of Jesus Christ and he possesses the key. See, the reason why we are not seeing more of the master key is because God is not seeing more of the use of us using the right key. See, we go and use the world's key to unlock heaven. Those keys don't fit in that lock. I shared with you before how I was in New York and I was at the Marriott Hotel and I checked out, caught a plane to Chicago, got into the Hilton Hotel, went up 35 floors in the dead of winter with my luggage, freezing outside. I put my key in the lock, click, click, red light, click, click, red light, click, click, red light. So I'm a little ticked off now because I've been going up 35 floors. It's cold outside. I catch the elevator down. I go to the registration desk. I say, excuse me, this key doesn't work. He said, because that key doesn't go to this hotel. <laughs> I had forgotten to throw away my Marriott key and was using a Marriott key in a Hilton lock and those kingdoms don't fit. You know, those, those, those kingdoms, those, those keys don't fit when you mix in kingdoms. And what Christians do is they mix kingdoms and wonder why heaven's door won't open. Because God won't use the king key if you won't use your key. Your key must be consistent with his master key. And he says when God moves, when Jesus moves specifically, he opens and closes doors. And he says when he moves with his key, that is with his divine authority he says when he does that nobody can shut it okay this ought to do something to your gizzard right there right there right there let me tell you what I'll do with your gizzard what this means is when you're using God's keys People do not have the last say so. Mm, see that? See? We get all shook up about people. Oh, he got the power to let me in or to lock me out. He got the power to raise me or to put me down. He's got the power. She's got the power to fire me or hire me. They got the power. They got all the power. Jesus said, but I got the master key. And when I open the door, I don't care who they are, where they come from, how much they have, what degrees they possess. When I have the key, if I decide to open that door, nobody's going to shut the door I open. And if I decide to lock them up, they're not going to be able to get back in because I'm in charge here. I've got the key to the kingdom. See, we fear the wrong folk. We fear folk because they got a name. We fear folk because they got some money. We fear folk because they got some power. But you are related to the one who's got the key of David. Ultimate authority. Final say so. So he's, you know, you, you ever been into a prison? To, to, for one reason or another? <laughs> you know, they got these pods now, these elevated pods where the, the gods sit. And they, they got all these keys to let folk in or to block folks out. The world wants to hold you hostage and Jesus says, but I got the key to every cell. I got the key to every door. So it's the one with the key who determines it. And if, if you don't get that and if I don't get that, we'll run around like chickens with our heads cut off trying to get folk to do what folk may or may not be willing to do when you're supposed to know the one who's got the master key to any door that you have to deal with. Yeah, we got to understand who we're dealing with here. He says, I possess the keys. So what's the problem? He says in verse 8, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. Because you have little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Oh, watch it. In order for his key to work, for you, for me, and for his church, he says, you must have kept my word, obeyed me, and not denied my name. 
So one of the reasons many believers are not seeing God come through is because they do not keep his word. They, they come to church and hear it, but they do not keep his word and or they deny his name. They don't want to be publicly associated with him. He says to them, you have little power. That means this is a small church that doesn't have big names, doesn't have notoriety people, doesn't have highly educated folk, doesn't have a bunch of rich, rich saints sitting in the sanctuary. He says, you have little power. <laughs> you not all that in a bag of chips. People don't know who you are. They don't appreciate who you are. They don't respect who you are. You don't have what people view as substantive, significant, and worth applauding. But he says, I have set before you an open door. Even though folks say you are a nothing and a nobody, I have set before you an open door. And when I open this bad boy up for you, the folk with the name, with the money, and with the power will not be able to shut it. But the way I will open the door and the reason I will open the door for you, your life, your world, and your ministry is because you have obeyed my word and have not denied my name. See, we got folk wanting to God open doors when they, while they disobey him. We got folk wanting God to open doors while they are ashamed to bear his name. Notice, you can't deny his name. You can talk about God all you want. You can talk about God this and God that. That's not his name. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. Not this generic God. No, no, no. Yeah, God is there, but God has bequeathed or delegated everything to his son. It is at the name of Jesus every knee bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. So if folk don't know your relationship to Jesus, you have denied his name, even though you may be talking about God bless you all day long. You haven't did not denied my name. Jesus says, when you deny me on earth, I will deny you before my Father who is in heaven. When you confess me on earth, I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. So if you are ashamed of Jesus Christ and don't want to be publicly associated with him, forget open doors. You can open your own door. And that's why we get so messed up because we're around here trying to get folk to open up the door, create the opportunity, make the connection, give us the money, and we're doing all this to open up doors and Jesus is sitting there with a master key. And, and, and if you've never seen God give you an open door, you see, you didn't miss something. If, 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 if you've never seen God swing something open that looked like it was closed. You see, if you've never seen him come through when there was no way, Jose, if, if you've never seen him intervene in your circumstances, then you have not experienced the authority of Christ to overrule particularly if you were of little power. Now, you didn't have the wherewithal. You didn't have the contacts. You didn't have the money. You didn't have the education. You didn't have the notoriety, but you had him. Sometimes around the church, people I don't know will, 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 will be around and, and maybe the custodial staff is not around and they need to get into some place legitimately. And they're running to me. I, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't know their name. I'm not familiar with them, for just because of the number of people. And they'll say, "Well, Pastor, can I get can I get in this room to do something legitimate, whatever it is?" Well, uh, I got a master key. I, I got a master key, and and even though they're unknown, they know me. So even though they're unknown and it's legitimate and they know me, because I got a master key, I can open up a door. When other folk aren't around, I can open up a door. Jesus says, folk may not know who you are, but you know him. You confess him. 
you obey him. He got a master key. And nothing will make the Lord more real to you than he, when he opens things up, you were too powerless to open up on your own because you had little power, little notoriety, little name recognition. See, that's why the, the greatest people in our congregation are not necessarily the people with masters and doctorate degrees. Not necessarily the folks with Mercedes and, and Benzes and, and Lincolns and what have you. It's not, no, it's not necessarily the folk who, who got the six-figure plus incomes. Nothing wrong with any of those things in and of themselves, but, but you have to need to know the most powerful people are people of little power who know him and who advertise his name because they have access to a master key. Now, the, the upscale folk can do that too, but he says, you have little power, but you have access to me. That's why um, I would suggest for me and for us, no matter what position you hold, money you have, or influence you will, keep yourself small. Okay. Folk may be whispering in your ear, oh, you all that, and a bag of chips. Don't believe it. You better keep yourself small in the eyes of God. Pride cometh before the fall. You better keep yourself small. Don't, don't think you all that. Because uh, pride cometh before the fall. And, and, and you need to understand that uh, humility is a big deal to God. That you, you, you don't view yourself that way. Now other folk may be right you out, but, 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 but how you think about you, you better keep yourself small because Jesus says, even though you have little power, I'm going to open up a door for you because you have obeyed me and you have uh, not denied my name. If God has blessed you, praise God. If God has given you a great job, bless God. If God has given you a big house, bless God. If God has given you a nice car, bless God. God has given you great clothes, bless God. Just so long as you know, you're no better than the widow on fixed income because God will open doors for those with little power. So it's okay if we're blessed, just don't become elite. Don't become, don't become big-headed. Think, think you all that. No, uh-uh, uh-uh. Uh -uh. On, on our best day, when we've been blessed the best, <laughs> you are a sinner saved by grace. That's on your best day. I'm a sinner saved by grace on my best day. Don't you ever forget that. Because if you never forget that, then you don't look down on people who don't have your education, your money, your job, your career, your house. You don't look down on anybody because you may be looking down on somebody who has access to a master key. Says you have little power. But I have opened up a door. And I've opened up a door for two reasons. You obey me and you don't deny me. See, because cause when, you, when you get a lot of power, then you get self-sufficient. You know, we, we have this tendency, we all do, to get self-sufficient. I can make it on my own. I got Viva and MasterCard, American Express. I can, I can make it on my own. I know people. Okay? If you know Jesus Christ, you know somebody. Okay? You know people. And he says, and I open the door and nobody will shut a door I open. I don't care what their name is and how much power they wield and how much money they have. He says in verse 9, Behold, I've, you have kept the word of my perseverance and I will also keep you from the hour of testing, the hour that is about to come upon the whole world. He told him in verse 9, Behold, I've caused those in the sanctuary synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet. 
and make them know that I have loved you. Whoa. <laughs> he said, all those false folk out there, synagogue of Satan, they, they go to church, synagogue, but they're of the devil. Because just because just you're in church, synagogue, doesn't mean you of the Lord. There is a synagogue of Satan. All right? So, so the religious talk doesn't mean a thing. He says, but I'm going to let them know that I have loved you. Even though you got a little power, I'm going to let them know you got more power than you look like you have. Maybe you remember the story about a big dog and little puppy. German Shepherd and a poodle. German Shepherd and a poodle were standing at a door. Were standing at a door and big dog, the, sh the shepherd, looked at the poodle, uh, poodle and said, you, you little puppy, you can't, you, 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 you can't do much. Look how small you are. Look how short you are. You know, you, 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 you got that little, 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 little girl bark. <laughs> I'm big dog. <laughs> I'm big dog. Say, so, look at this door. I wonder how long it would take you to get open this door and because I can open this door. I can open this door quickly because I'm big and, and I can reach the knob. You can't even reach the knob. In fact, let's have a contest. Let's see who can open the door the quickest. Little puppy said, okay, you, you go first, big dog. <laughs> big dog, you go first. German shepherd jumped up on the door, got his mouth around the knob. <laughs> And put his put his put his mouth all around the knob and started twisting at the knob. And after about two and a half minutes of working the knob, he got the door open. And then he pulled it shut and he said, "Beat that, a little puppy, because big dog didn't show you. You can't even reach the knob. Your turn." Little puppy came up to the door, gave a small bark. Scratched the door. The man on the inside came and opened it. Because see, when you know who's on the inside, you ain't got to go through all that. So don't, don't let it bother you if you're a little puppy. Because if you know the Lord, he's got the key. And he can open up what the big dogs can't help you with. He said, you got, you got the synagogue of Satan and they messing with you. Uh, they calling you holier than thou. They think, they think, they, they, they say, oh, you one of them Bible people and you, you, you got, you bring up Jesus all the time and you go, you one of them. And yeah, they can make you feel bad. He says, in the synagogue of Satan is making it tough for you, but I can keep, watch this, I can keep you from the hour of testing. He calls it, you in a test, watch this. So if you're in a situation and the door has not yet opened, he says, consider it a test. And he says, and I'm going to walk you through the test until I reverse it. He says, I'm going to make your enemies your footstool. Ooh. Nothing makes God real than when he reverses the irreversible. Nothing makes God more real than when he flips something that looked unflippable. Nothing made God so powerful to you when there was no way out. You were trapped. The devil was looked like he was running the whole show. And then he reverses it. But you may say, but, but I don't see him doing anything. Oh yeah, well look at the next verse. He says, you're going through this test and I'm going to keep you through this hour. But I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that none, no one will take your crown. Oh, I love this word. I am coming quickly. That means suddenly. That means unexpectedly. That means uh, out of nowhere. See, when God is silent, that doesn't mean he's still. I know you don't see him doing anything. I know it looks like you're just waiting for nothing. But God likes to come in suddenly. 
He likes to break in when you didn't expect it, when you didn't think there was any way that this thing could ever get better, that this trial could ever end. He loves to do something suddenly. And the reason why he likes to do things quickly or suddenly is so that when it happens, there is no debate on who caused it to take place. Because it, it came out of nowhere. Quickly. You wonder, whoo, where did that come from? And it becomes inextricably clear that this was heaven invading history because God wants to join a favorite R&B group so that when you have seen him come through suddenly, you can start singing that song. Didn't I blow your mind this time? Didn't I? He wants to blow your mind. And so, boom, he comes through suddenly. He says, and I will come quickly. So don't worry about it if you don't have all the degrees and if you don't have all the money and you don't have all the prestige and you don't have all the power and people don't applaud you when you walk into the room. Don't worry about it. Just obey him. Don't deny his name. And then wait for the Lord, I say. Wait upon the Lord. Because he comes suddenly. And once you have this perspective, you're free. Because you know them people don't have the last say. <laughs> they have a say, they don't have the say. Yeah, they, 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 they look like they're running the show until God swoops in on them and changes them or changes their mind or changes you or changes the circumstances. It's like... It's like that time the folks, when we were getting our church, the folks told us we couldn't meet in the school anymore. We didn't have a place to go. They were going to vote whether they were going to let us stay or to put us out. God caused there to be an accident on the freeway so the people who were going to vote against us who were riding in the same car couldn't get off the off-ramp. And when the council couldn't wait for them any longer, they voted without them. We won five to four. As soon as the vote was over, they came rushing in. It was too late. Because God over, over, overturned that thing. And if, you, if you've never seen God do that, if you don't know what God can do, then, you, then you're, just living, you're just living with based on what man can do. And men do not have the final say so. And that's why, that's why you're free. <laughs> you're free. You're free. People don't get the final word because they don't have the master key to your life, to your world, to your family. They don't, they don't control it. He says, I have the master key. That must be your perspective. Perspective is everything. It's like the Montana, Montana put out a thing for catching wolves. And they were, they were going to pay $5,000 for any trapper who caught a wolf. $5,000 per wolf. Sam and Jed decided to go wolf hunting in because that's $5,000 a wolf. So they went wolf hunting in Montana. They put up their tent. They got in their tent because the next day they were going to hunt for some wolves to get $5,000 a wolf. They go to sleep. Jed wakes up first in the morning. When Jed wakes up, there are 50 wolves, hungry wolves, surrounding their tent with blood red eyes, with, with saliva dripping down the side of their mouth, with them growling and those sharp teeth, 50, 50 wolves right there at their tent. Hungry wolves. Jeb woke up Sam, said, Sam, Sam, get up. Sam said, what? Jeb said, we're rich. <laughs> see, it all depends on your perspective. It, it all depends on how you see things. I know the devil may be nipping at you. The synagogue of Satan may be nipping at you. But when you've got God's perspective, it changes what you're looking at. And so, I'm coming quickly. I'm going to come suddenly. So what did he tell you to do in verse 11? Hold fast. Hold fast. Don't, I know you want to give up. I know you want to quit. And I know you're tired. He says, hold fast. Make sure you're obeying and not denying. You do. You hold fast to your obedience and non-denial. And at his time, suddenly, 
Don't let them take your crown. That's the right to rule. Even small folk have been called to rule. And now he gives us his final statement. He who overcomes, overcomes what? The tendency to give up. He who overcomes the tendencies to stop obeying and to stop denying. He who overcomes that and says, God, as the old folks say, I'm going to hold on until my change come. You know, it's rough, it's tough, but I believe you and not my circumstances as the final arbiter of my situation. He says, you hold on. He who overcomes, look at this, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He will not go out from it anymore. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. You see the word, that word, name, 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 name. First of all, he says, I'm going to make you a pillar. A pillar, it holds a building up. I'm going to make you a pillar in my temple. A temple is God's house. The pillars are located in God's house. Galatians 2.9 says that Peter, James, and John were the pillar of the church. They were, they were holding up the church. In other words, he speaks of these people who overcome the, the propensity to give up as being in closest proximity to God. And he says for these folk who are overcomers and who are in close proximity to God, they will have a name. And he keeps saying name, 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 name in that in verse in verse uh, 12 over and over again. He keeps talking about name of this and name of that, name of this and name of that. He says you will have a name in the new Jerusalem. Let's get something straight. Everybody is not equal in heaven. Okay, let's get this straight. Okay, you can have a 40 watt bulb a 60 watt bulb, a 75 watt bulb in your house, a 100 watt bulb in your house, a 150 watt bulb in your house. Now all of them are bulbs and all of them will light to their capacity but everybody's capacity isn't the same. A 40 watt can't give you a 100 watts because it's not established to be able to produce like that. Well, all Christians are Christians but they don't have the same watts and so they don't exude the same experience because they don't have the same relationship. Jesus said in St. John chapter 2 verses 23 to 25 it says many believed on him. Many believed on him but he would not commit himself to them because he knew what was in them. They got saved but they had not yet got committed. They were on their way to heaven, but he couldn't use them on earth. They were forgiven for their sins, but they didn't want folk to know that they were Christians. They went to church, but they wouldn't obey the word. So they believed in him, but he wouldn't make no commitment to them. There are a lot of Christians who Jesus is just not deeply committed to in a practical way because they want to be 40 watt Christians expecting a 100 watt blessing and it doesn't work that way. He wants to know that you're all in. That you're a full time Christian not a part time saint. He wants to know that you will not deny him and that you will obey what he has commanded. And he says to that one I will give him a name. You know when you when people go to the